With respect to tongue reduction, the biggest question, as with any operation, is um, do the benefits outweigh the risks? Um, uh, all operations have some risk, um, and one certainly would not perform any operation if it had no benefit. Um, so the real question in the Beckwith-Wiedemann individual is looking at benefit versus risk. Um, for which part of the population do benefits outweigh risks? Um, and in uh, my opinion and my experience with uh, now over 130 tongue reductions, um, the population that benefit are the population who are young, meaning ideally under two years of age, but probably also benefit up through uh, mid-childhood until they start really getting their permanent teeth in. And having an abnormal relationship between the upper and lower jaw. Um, this can even be assessed in the newborn, even though they don't have teeth usually, um, because the gums will be in the wrong position. The, the lower jaw gum will be in front of the upper jaw gum um, in the more severely affected Beckwith-Wiedemann uh, baby. Um, it's a little bit easier to assess once they do have teeth. Um, so any child uh, who uh, in uh, early childhood has an abnormal relationship where the lower teeth or the lower gum is in front of the upper teeth or the upper gum uh, is definitely a candidate. Uh, the other benefit is psychosocial. Um, I've personally seen now over 200 individuals with Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome, both with and without tongue reduction. And for those who do not have early tongue reduction, by at the latest, age six, they learn to keep their tongue in their mouth. Now, historically, it's been said that um, the body um, adjusts to the tongue um, and that the, the big tongue is no longer a problem. That's not really what happens. The individual learns to keep the tongue in the mouth, but it continues to deform the teeth and the jaws, so it's certainly not a normal situation. But psychosocially, a lot of us, when we concentrate, will stick our tongue out a little bit. And so the child who has learned to keep their tongue in when they're at school and they're reading or they're writing or they're coloring, instead of a little bit of tongue coming out, the big tongue comes out and then the other children see it and there is teasing. So there also is a psychosocial benefit. On the other hand, um, if one asks the question um, for what Beckwith-Wiedemann patients do I not do tongue reduction surgery, Every now and then, it's uncommon, but I do see them now and then, um, I see a child who does not have an abnormal relationship between the upper and lower jaw or has a very minimally abnormal relationship. And in those cases, I do not perform surgery um, because I don't know what's going to happen over time, and we observe those children. If they stay stable, then I do not do tongue reduction surgery. Um, if they deteriorate, meaning that the tooth and jaw relationship gets worse over time, then I do recommend surgery. When a parent has a child with Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome and is considering the possibility of, of tongue reduction, um, simply because of the fact that this is a relatively rare condition um, and patients uh, come to me from all over the United States and in fact all over the world, uh, usually the initial contact these days is through email um, and then I have a standard set of questions that I return back to the family and if they haven't sent me photos I have them send me photos. Then at that point um, after some uh, discussion back and forth and having gotten baseline medical information um, we make arrangements for the family to come to St. Louis um, either for evaluation alone or if they want to package it together, evaluation and surgery, providing that once I physically see the child, I still agree that surgery is appropriate. Um, the child is also evaluated before surgery by our speech-language pathologist, um, both in terms of speech and feeding. Um, and while very young children obviously aren't talking, um, they do have behaviors that tell us a great deal about language development um, and behaviors that will lead to speech. That's important because about 50% of the Beckwith-Wiedemann population with or without tongue reduction will need some speech therapy. Um, we also have available additional uh, consultation with respect to Beckwith-Wiedemann itself in terms of cancer risk and in terms of genetic recurrence um, if the families do not feel that they've gotten adequate information in their uh, local home situation and that varies from from locale to locale. 
before the surgery, um, I discuss the operation in detail with the family. I draw them a picture um, of the actual operation that I perform. We talk about what it's going to be like for the child going through the operation. We talk about what it's going to be like for the family going through the operation. Um, on the day of surgery, uh, they come to hospital. Um, then the child has the operation. Um, the surgery takes about one hour. Um, the baby's in the operating room about an hour and a half from the time they go to sleep to the time they wake up. Um, after surgery is over, I go out and talk to the parents, explain to them um, how everything went. Um, the, the breathing tube is taken out that we use during the operation. is taken out um, uh, in the operating room. The child goes to the pediatric recovery room. Um, in our hospital, um, one parent can sit with the child in the recovery room. Um, and then uh, after the uh, recovery phase is over, they go to the pediatric intensive care unit. We keep them there overnight um, as a safety precaution. Um, I feel very strongly that uh, uh, if one uh, uses precautions, um, then you can minimize the chance of risk. You can never eliminate it completely, um, but um, uh, using this protocol, um, we've not had any problems immediately following surgery, um, and I would hope that we won't. Um, then the child goes to a regular floor room. Um, and again, in our hospital, we have uh, the facility for one parent to room in with the child, which we encourage. Um, and the child stays in hospital until the child is willing to uh, eat and drink and be comfortable on oral pain medicine. And that varies from child to child. Um, the minimum time is three days, and the most stubborn child I ever had was nine days. The average is about five. Um, people who live in the local area, um, once they're released from hospital, um, usually go home. Um, people who have to travel a distance, um, I recommend that they stay 24 to 48 hours just to be certain that everything's stable, although I've never actually had to readmit somebody. Um, and then because of the, the distance for most of the families, uh, most of the follow-up then is, again, pretty much done through email. Um, or letters and photographs um, and communicating with their local health care professionals. Um, we offer our services, my services, our speech language pathologist, our dentist, our orthodontist, um, psychologist, whatever additional services might be necessary. Those individuals are here in for consultation with the local providers so that if, as time passes, um, issues arise that are related uh, to these various healthcare disciplines, then the family uh, can have their local healthcare provider contact uh, either me or our specific provider in that discipline 